I want to clear a couple things up about some Barry Harris things we've talked about on this channel. This week marks the end of my first year of being on YouTube, and in the past year I've made 53 videos and six of those were on Barry Harris. It's really such a privilege to have the chance to share what I've learned by studying Barry with you. But this also comes with a heavy responsibility to make sure that the content is accurate. So I'm going to clarify a couple things and then we're going to get into answering a bunch of your Barry Harris questions you've submitted the last year. The first thing I want to talk about is this idea that there are rules that we follow when we play jazz. Because there were a lot of comments from you saying, just be free, play what sounds good, listen to your ear, and that's what hey, you should solo. The master's never thought about these rules. When I teach Barry's method, it's important to me that I respect the way that Barry taught it, at least to the best of my ability and my own understanding. If you go back and watch Barry's original teaching, he called these things rules, and so that's what I called them. And I, I practice rules for the seventh scale. Maybe we all but you have to understand this in the context of Barry's teaching. And this is where I failed to communicate a little bit in the videos. So Barry was teaching these in workshops, either in New York City, where he did this for decades, or other places around the world. My interpretation is that these rules are his way of codifying all these different things he observed by playing with the greats over the years. These were just a deconstruction of the things he was hearing in a way that he could teach them to the masses. If you go back and watch recordings of those original workshops, you hear Barry kind of rail on the traditional academic way of teaching. He was very clear that like the players that he respected and the ones that he grew up learning from, they didn't learn it from a university setting. They learned it in the clubs that they were playing. They learned it in their jam sessions. They were creative. They were inventing. They were creating something new. And a lot of online discussions around Barry's uh, discussions in my own comment streams and elsewhere on the internet, people are quick to say that you can't deconstruct Charlie Parker into a formula and then teach yourself that formula and become Charlie Parker. And Barry is definitely not saying that. My friend Jens Larsen, who's a great bebop player, even though he's a guitar player, I won't hold that against him, he addressed the same thing in one of his videos a couple weeks ago. And whenever I say that, then there are people in the comments who start complaining that I say that it is a rule, which is really weird. I guess it'll be interesting to see if they already stopped the video and are typing angrily without watching the next 10 seconds. Barry was a master at finding a way to, to show you the important parts of what they were playing in a way that you could apply them yourself and practice them. And then through that, you could discover your own sound and become your own unique bebop artist. It was never about trying to replicate Charlie Parker. Okay, this segues me into the next thing I wanna talk about, which is that these ideas, these exercises, these rules that Barry gave us to practice, he absolutely intended for us to practice them literally exactly the way he taught them, but he did not intend for us to perform these ideas to try and think in real time while you're creating a solo line that oh this is a g7 chord i can use a six on the fifth that means d minor six so i can play d minor six six diminished that means it has a b flat in it so i'm going to play this line there is no freaking way that you're going to be able to calculate that on the fly and create anything musically interesting at all that is not what Barry's teaching is all about. Again, this is my interpretation of things, but my understanding is what Barry wanted us to do was to practice these things so that they became part of our ears, so they became part of our hands. When we're out performing, it's our turn to solo and we see that same G7 chord, our ears and our hands, I've already practiced G7 so much that we just invent things. We just hear things in our head. And those things that we invent are inspired by the things that we had practiced. So we're not literally thinking about all these rules and different ideas in the moment that we're performing. We're practicing them so diligently so that our hands have the technique and that our ears are trained to hear new ideas. So that when we're soloing, we hear more authentic bebop lines in our head and those are the lines that come out. So that leads me to our first question, which is what exactly am I supposed to practice? <laughs> because you are supposed to practice exactly the exercises that Barry teaches you. But like we said, we're not gonna use these when we perform, so how do I take it from there into the performance? And so my answer to this is basically you experiment. So you extract whatever the core idea is from the exercise, and then you practice putting it into tunes in context. So as an example, if we wanted to practice Barry's ideas of brothers and sister chords as substitutions for dominant chords, what we would do is just take a couple jazz standards, preferably ones we already know pretty well, look for the dominant chords, and every single time there's a dominant chord, we practice all the different brothers and sister combinations. So if we were playing the B section of Take the A Train, we've got a big dominant seventh chord for two measures. Barry taught us a bunch of brothers and sister chords we could play over this G7. This comes from my video on dominant chords coming from diminished. One of those variations is he says we can play an E chord over that G. Let's try it. So that's one option we could use. Another one he threw out, A flat minor six. Let's try that one. So 
this is exactly what I would do. I would take the, you know, the different brothers and sister chord options, and I would apply it to every dominant seventh chord in the tune. I would do it over 10 different tunes. It doesn't matter what technique you're practicing specifically. I'm using brothers and sisters as an example here, but you would do the same thing if you were practicing the dominant scale rules. The more you do it, the more fluid you get, the more naturally it's gonna come out in your performances without you really consciously thinking about the techniques. This next question comes from literally everybody who watched my Barry Harris video on six on the fifth. Apparently I missed the boat with this one. Six on the fifth, isn't that just a nine chord? <laughs> so let's talk about it. What Barry is saying is when you see a major chord, you can voice that major chord by using the sixth chord that's on the fifth. So if we're talking about a C major chord, you would go up to the fifth of C, which is G, and you would play a G major six chord on top of it. So if we look at those four notes of G6, three of them already belong to C major seven, right? The G is the fifth of C, the B is the seventh of C, and the E is the third of C. The only one that's the odd man out here is the D. And that D being the ninth of C, you could easily call this a C major nine chord. I've heard other people talk about this actually, where you can just take a normal C major seven chord, move the C up a whole step, and that's how you find your six on the fifth chord. It's like a shortcut. It is the same thing. Even if you're pretty well versed in the traditional way of thinking about jazz, this might seem like a distraction to you. And, th and that's fair enough. But I would encourage you maybe to just spend a little bit of time studying it because Barry builds on this as a foundation for other ideas and things that I find, um, some of those things I find more difficult to understand the traditional way. So for example, if we were gonna voice a C major chord using a G major six on top, it could sound like this. And then to add tension and release, we would borrow diminished notes from the G6 diminished scale, which could sound something like this. Notice how when we do that, we would borrow this F sharp because F sharp is part of G major six diminished. That would be F natural and C six diminished. If you, and if you know this the traditional way, you would know that you sharp the 11 when you play a major chord. It gives you a Lydian sound. Barry didn't have to think about any of that modal stuff and Lydian and sharp 11s and all that stuff. He just thought G six diminished with some borrowed diminished notes. This is more than just an esoteric way of describing what the traditional method says. This is a, a kind of a ground up rebuild of the way Western harmony works. There's a lot of overlap actually between this and what Schoenberg teaches. Barry was really influenced by Schoenberg's classical work. So Alejandro Gonzalez asks, would this mean that a one, six, four, five, seven percussion, would I be playing the same one, six chord over the first three chords? So what this is saying is if I take one chord, the four chord and the six chord, and I use the six on the fifth rules to find the substitute chords, aren't those all the same chord? Let's look at it. In the key of C, we could play, for one, we would play C6. For six, which is A minor seven, we learned that you would find the, the six chord on the minor third. A minor seven is the same as C6. And then F, F major, we would find the six on the fifth, which is C6. So Alejandro, you're exactly right. You could in fact play C6 over the one, the six and the four. In my opinion, it might sound a little bit stagnant to not change the chord around, but there's some really interesting diminished moves you can do over top of it that would sound great. Okay, the next question comes from Time Crystal. Can you talk a little bit more about why you feel that a minor six chord is more stable than a minor seven? So if we're playing this C minor seven, a traditional C minor seven, to me, this C minor seven sounds like it's part of a two five. Whereas if you just play C minor six, it just sounds much more consonant, much more resolved. This has like movement built into it, where this just, so remember in this context, the minor that we're talking about is melodic minor. So it has a major seven, not a flat seven. And that's an important distinction, right? So we wouldn't actually play this chord. We would play this chord. So in that context, maybe you can hear that this is more consonant than this. That's got a lot of tension in it. The reason that Barry says this has so much tension in it is because this is actually C minor with one borrowed diminished note. So if we're playing a C minor six diminished scale, We have these notes that belong to C minor and these diminished notes that go with it. And so when you're playing a C minor major seven, what Barry thinks of is playing three notes from C minor and one borrowed diminished note. And so what Barry would do with this is he would resolve the diminished note to a consonant note. 
Juice Patrol asks, what diminished chord can you use as a passing chord when changing from one chord to another? So I clarified this question with him and he's talking about like, what happens if I'm moving to another chord in the key? Like if I'm moving to the four chord? The answer here is you use the diminished chord that belongs to the four chord. And you get to kind of choose when you want to make that switch. So if we were playing like Fly Me to the Moon in the key of C, Fly Me to the Moon goes from C to F, from one to four. So to play our melody, we would use C6 and we would use D diminished, which is the diminished chord that goes with C. But as we're getting ready to go into F, into the four chord, we might want to use the diminished chord that belongs to the four. In that case, that would be G diminished. So I switched from the C6 diminished scale into the F6 diminished scale. And I actually did it a beat early because I wanted to use that diminished chord as a way to lead my way into that chord. Brett Price asks a fantastic question. What exercises or practice methods do you use to open up some of the voicings associated with minor six diminished scale chords? Actually, I do the same thing for major or minor. So let's talk major here. Just because we're in C major, let's stay in C major, but the same thing applies. So what Brett is talking about are these closed position six diminished chords that sound like this. Brett, you're a great player, so this is probably something you already know, but the first step would be to go drop two. So when we're thinking drop two, we number our voicings from the top down, like a like we would in a church choir, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, alto being the two, and you take that down an octave. So if we were playing C, we would take this A, we drop it down here. And then you do the same, practice the same scales. And there's a lot more things that you can do similar to this. So here's another one that I like to do is you just take the four notes and put them in whatever order you want. We've got C, E, G, and A. That's our C6 chord. Let's just put them in a different order. Let's do C, A, E, G. And now let's run that up the scale. Let's try a whole bunch of different versions of that. Let's try um, E, A, E, G. Sounds great. I need to practice that one. That one's sweet. Christian Manny asks, uh, you stated that C major seven had an unresolved sound because of the B natural once to resolve down to the six. But then you said to use the G major six chord, which also has a B natural in it. So it doesn't really solve the problem. Yeah, I, uh, it does solve the problem, but I get where you're coming from. This, this is actually really similar to the question Time Crystal asked earlier about the minor six chords versus minor seven chords. If your song calls for C6, you can totally play C6. You gotta be a little more careful if you play C major seven instead, especially if C is in the melody. And that's because of this clash here. In Barry's world, our C major seven chord is actually C major with a borrowed diminished note. But just like what we said with Time Crystal, the diminished note wants to resolve down. So that's why the B natural is not resolved. But you're very astute and you noticed that when I said you can play a G major six chord over top of C to get that six on the fifth sound. Well, there it is. <laughs> There's that B natural again. And why is it okay in this case, but not in the other case? This is where you gotta turn off your traditional training a little bit and try and look at this through Barry's eyes. On our C six chord, B natural is a borrowed diminished note, but on G six, B natural is part of G six. It's not diminished. This is our G6 diminished scale. Right? So this is a consonant note, not a diminished note. It is a little weird, and I love your attention to detail. Francesco asks, great lesson. Thanks, Francesco. Could you please make a tutorial on Barry Harris's elevator concept and some practical applications? I'm not gonna make a whole video on just the elevator, but let me show you how it works real quick. So this is what the elevator sounds like. So if you've worked on your six diminished scale and you know that you can alternate the notes of C6 and D diminished. C6, D diminished. C6, D diminished. It alternates. So all we're doing with the elevator is we're just doing this in contrary motion. So we start this way. We start with our thumbs on C and we're gonna move in opposite directions. D6, D diminished. D6, D diminished. D6, 
And the only other trick to really flesh this out is that as your hands get further apart, your other fingers fill in the notes in the middle. So D6, D diminished. Now we're going to play C6 again, but we're going to fill in the C. Now we're going to play D diminished. We're going to fill in the B and the D. Now we're going to play C6. We're going to fill in A, C, E. And Francesco, there are so many practical applications for when you can do this. At any place in a song where you're able to like fill time, so that might be in an intro or an outro, it could be because the melody is holding and you're parked out on a chord for a while. This is a great way to just introduce some movement. So Neo Colors asks, is there a lesson video book that builds upon this concept? I'm a trumpet player. Awesome. I used to be a trombone player. Are there books or resources available that will teach you Barry's methods? There are definitely some great resources out there. Barry himself has a two disc DVD set that you can buy that goes through this really well. Highly, highly recommend it. Of course, you can go to the original source himself, which is the Barry Harris videos channel here on YouTube. There's just hours of archives of Barry teaching at workshops. The thing about these workshop videos is that they can be pretty advanced and they move really fast. These are more like they just set up a, a camera and let it roll. Barry wasn't producing something specifically to be recorded. He was being social in the workshop with the players that were there. And the kind of people that go to these workshops tended to be pretty advanced players. So things move fast. There's a lot of assumptions of prior knowledge in them. This is one of my main goals with this channel actually, is to find those important ideas that are in those Barry Harris videos and try and pull them out and teach them individually. I'm not the only person on YouTube teaching Barry's methods. I'm definitely not the best one teaching. I would highly recommend that you go check out Things I Learned from Barry Harris. That's my friend Chris Parks's channel. Chris and Barry knew each other quite well. Personally, there was a friendship there and Chris went to workshops for many years. Chris knows this stuff probably better than any other human alive on the planet today. I cannot recommend him highly enough. Just, his channel is just so, oh, chef's kiss. <laughs> his channel is so good. The other recommendation I would make would be Alan Kingston's book. Again, this is written for guitars, but it's totally applicable to piano players or other instrumentalists. The book is a little bit old and can be a little bit hard to find. You know, Barry's methods are not exactly new, so I wouldn't say the book is outdated, but it can be a little tricky to find. So I've also compiled a playlist of all the Barry videos on this channel. It's right here. You can click on this and watch all six of them. So go ahead and hit subscribe on the channel to make sure that you get those when they come out.